Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's the third Monday of the month, which means it's time for Healing Spices with Dr. Sunil Pai. This is episode nine, where we talk about nutmeg, onion, oregano, and parsley. Please welcome the guest with the best backdrop of any guest of Chef AJ Live, Dr. Pai. So good to see you. So good to be back. Thank you for inviting me. I'm hoping everybody's been able to catch up on all the episodes. There's nine episodes. If you're just joining us today, then go back. There's nine different episodes, four spices each episode. Start catching up, and it's a great way to start learning how to bring more spice into your life. Well, I'm excited about onion, and I tell you why, because I'm a chef, okay. and I personally, and especially I'm a chef that d doesn't use salt, I do not know how to make anything taste good without onion. And yeah. I've had a lot of chefs on the show, and they've actually said to me, one was one actually said, you know, onion is the foundation of French cooking. And I'm thinking, it's the foundation of all cooking. And I know there's people, either for religious reasons or food intolerance reasons, don't aren't able to have onions, but how do you, how do you live without onions? I know I'm a, I love it on, I put it in, a, I mean, because in most of the foods that we do eat and most of the recipes that we do make, you know, there's a certain amount of spices that are just common, right? Like onions and garlic and ginger and, you know, coriander, cumin, turmeric. There's things that we use in Asian cooking, you know, all the time, but onions is goes all, across the palate too. Then it goes to French cooking. It goes to, you know, every, every Asian cooking and it's even American cooking. People think of like onion rings, which I'll have a show a picture of just to show for those people who don't cook, but it's a great thing because it does have a lot of health benefits. So let's get started. Yep. Can't wait. All right. So, all right. So today we're going to be talking about nutmegs, onion, oregano, and parsley. Again, my name is Dr. Pai. Our websites are down here, sanjevany.net, sanjevanystore.com. You can get my bestseller book, aninflammationnation.com, and you can get a signed copy, or you can look at our natural anti-inflammatory bosmeric.com to learn about the four natural ingredients that have been clinically tested to provide you the best anti-inflammatory support. Now see here. All right. Before we get started, I just want to let everybody know who's watching. We are going to have our end of the year sale. So December 22nd, which is Friday, up until January 1st, you get 10% off of anything in our store. So please come by and, on, online and uh, purchase uh, some wonderful products as gifts, or you can even purchase gift certificates or a consultation with uh, me or Maureen Sutton for an integrative consult or an Ayurvedic consult or a nutritional consult. But again, December 22nd, the January 1st, 10% off all our wonderful products like Bosmeric and more. So today, again, I'm going to talk about uh, spices, healing spices, and a lot of information that we talk about comes from my book, An Inflammation Nation, and more importantly, this wonderful book from a colleague of mine, Dr. Agawal, called Healing Spices. These are two books that I would recommend all of you to get that you'll have for you know learning the 10 definitive steps on preventing and treating and reversing all diseases from diet and lifestyle, and also having a Healing Spices uh, book to learn about 50 uh, uh, spices. Today, we're on like 32, 33, so we got plenty more to go in, in this series, but it's a great book that I I'm just summarizing from my colleague to provide you with some information to hopefully tease you to get into using more food as medicine. And remember, plant-based diets is what it's all about. That's where all the data will show, all the evidence will show. However, what I have seen personally since 2006, moving into a plant-based practice, uh, we have the largest plant-based practice here in, in, in New Mexico and the Southwest actually now, is that you know a lot of people are introduced to plant-based foods, but they're not really introduced in using the spices. And so through these episodes, we're trying to introduce you how to bring more spice to your life and also how to bring more food to the medicine. And that's what we want to talk, talk about today. So number 33 uh, out of 50. So we're getting close. Uh, nutmeg, a sprinkle of healing. Now, nutmeg is one of my favorite spices, as you can see here over on the right hand side of the picture of it. And, you know, it goes back, you know, 14th century to 18th century, uh, Portugal, the French, the English, uh, and as well as in the Americas, we were trading uh, nutmeg very healthily. 
and then particularly in the 18th century, which is very interesting what I learned from reading this, is that uh, Connecticut became a state where they used it heavily. And in fact, it was, been, it was used for the upper echelon, particularly men would take the, the nutmeg specifically with them, they would carry it in their pockets. And it was something that to be very impressive in high society, uh, uh, particularly to the suitors that they were trying to meet, is, was to take the nutmeg out and actually kind of grind it fresh onto some of the food. Uh, and uh, also what we'll talk about is nutmeg has a, a really important role in helping libido uh, as a kind of a sexual enhancer, believe it or not. And uh, it was such a prized thing in Connecticut that uh, there was an illegal trade where the men were being sold just kind of like pieces of bark on a tree. And then they would go and not knowing, like, be just, you know, uh, grading a uh, tree bark on their food. But anyways, uh, and in, in fact, uh, early also on, uh, Connecticut was known as the nutmeg state. That's how much they, you know, uh, an off-label kind of uh, moniker of the name of the state. So kind of interesting, just a little bit of history of nutmeg. But nutmeg may help and prevent and treat the following. Anxiety, cancer, cholesterol, depression, diarrhea, which I'll talk about, uh, epilepsy, memory loss, increased libido, very, very important. Uh, there's a lot of data on that. And also topically, it's helping with wrinkles. Now, examples of nutmeg is going to be the following. A lot of people will think of like chai, uh, you know, eggnog right now since the holidays, right? We think of like pumpkin spice. We think of like waffles, cinnamon waffles and nutmeg and cookies, spice, holiday spice, and, you know, mulling spices like in the, in the cider or even the, the, the pumpkin spice latte, which is really popular here in America. But there's reasons why we like this, this spice because it goes so well, has that sweetness and it has this wonderful aroma. And also with these natural health abilities, it's important. Oops, I'm missing some things here. Uh, the health benefits. So let's start with the health benefits. You know, very interesting as a topical agent in Korea, they were looking at 150 different types of plants uh, for skin health and, and plants which inhibit elastase. This is an enzyme that breaks down elastin, uh, the, the proteins, the fibers in the skin that keeps your skin like really taut and flexible. And nutmeg was one of the six that provided the anti-aging benefits. So they are using uh, nutmeg in some topical uh, cosmetics or cosmeceuticals, particularly in Asia. And also it's been shown to have a little bit of UVB protection like sunscreen. Uh, so interesting, you know, we don't think of it as a topical, but it, there is topical applications. Now it does have something called myricetin, um, and that is the volatile oil in nutmeg, and it is very powerful. Um, it has been shown to kill a uh, rotavirus. Rotavirus, 90% of rotavirus, which, which is the most common viral diarrhea. And you'll see it in the news, like rotavirus being spread and, you know, like schools and hospitals and things like that. And in Ayurvedic medicine, there's a, a lot of traditional formulas and nutmeg is one of those components. And now we have the research of why it's given for diarrhea, considering that the viral diarrhea is one of the, you know, major causes of that. So rotavirus, it can knock out. It does help reduce total cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So very wonderful for heart health. It does help with uh, significant improvement in learning and memory uh, and also helps with mood support. Uh, it has uh, similar to anti-anxiety drugs in the studies. Um, in alleviating anxiety, it also has some antidepressant effects as well. So, you know, that's why, you know, it's funny, we use a lot of nutmeg during the holiday season. And it's not just the you know, alcohol, maybe in the, in, the, in the eggnog, for example, or the cocktail, but it's really the nutmeg spice that might be actually helping us feel more joyous and uh, helpful uh, and you know, festive. But also you might be able to use a little bit more nutmeg if the holidays are making you a little bit of stress. You might be able to take a little bit of uh, nutmeg uh, into your diet. Now, more importantly... You know, with some of the studies, they've been showing that actually nutmeg has a lot of aphrodisiac activity, in fact, increasing libido, significant and sustained increase in sexual activity. And so there's been a lot of studies like in for men's health, uh, looking at what fragrances and tastes kind of make men just a little bit more virile. Uh, and nutmeg is one of them. So it's very funny because when we look at like perfumes that women will wear or, you know, to, to attract men, uh, the interesting thing is like nutmeg is one of the strongest fragrances and actually flavors as well, but that's not really like in any kind of, you know, famous fragrance. So it's very, very interesting, but that's why during the holidays, when we smell it and we make these kind of uh, foods with it, it does kind of make men more cheerful and also women, by the way. So definitely made, uh, bring some more nutmeg into your life. As I mentioned before, again, a lot of the holidays just, but we use nutmeg for other things, but I like right now the season for all this wonderful uh, beverages 
And usually we use a lot of it for desserts. Now I actually have a pumpkin spice, you know, you can get at the store and, you know, it's going to have like the cin organic cinnamon, the organic uh, nutmeg. It's going to have a little bit of clove, sometimes all spice as well. Uh, and that's a great thing. You don't have to go to the fancy uh, coffee shop and spend $7 for it. Just make your real organic coffee and just sprinkle the, the mixture of the, uh, the, the pumpkin spice in there. And you can get, you know, organic soy milk, for example. And then you got your pumpkin spice latte and save $7, but actually get true health benefits. It's most of the pumpkin spice that you see there is actually using artificial flavors in the coffee shops uh, and flavor enhancers and, and fragrances. And so it's not real. So you won't get that like added benefit. All you're getting is just kind of fat and, and uh, sugar. Now, nutmeg is great because it pairs with a lot of spices. All spice, like I mentioned before, that it's usually getting like in a pumpkin spice mix. Amchur, um, which I mentioned before, remember, was that kind of mango, that dry mango, -y, that lemony kind of flavor. Cinnamon, my favorite. Clove, again, these are all the ones that when you say like pumpkin spice, those are the, the th uh, three, all spice, cinnamon, clove. Uh, cacao or uh, cocoa, which is one of my other favorites. Uh, coconut, coriander, ginger, and lemongrass. And it complements with... Uh, avocados, bananas, biscuits, bread, soups, tomatoes, vegetables, and a lot of like when we make bechamel sauces and stuff like that, we use a lot of, uh, in other cultures, we use the nutmeg as one of the main ingredients. Now, onions. So too strong for cancer. Onions is one of my favorite foods. I love to put onions on everything. Everybody thinks I'm crazy sometimes, but it's a great thing because I like to uh, grill my onions. I like to uh, caramelize onions as well. Um, and I like that sweetness of it, but it has a lot of research and onions may help and prevent. And there's a lot of different types of onions. As you can see, there's white onions and yellow onions and red onions. Uh, allergies, you know, BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, large prostate for men, cancer, cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, which is a new one. I, you know, until reading the book, I didn't have any idea the benefits of onions on osteoporosis. And many of you might have seen at the store uh, topical use of onion uh, extract for scars, which I'll go into. Now, when it comes to the onions, the onions have all health benefits, but the higher the, the benefits start becoming more diverse when you go from a white onion to a yellow onion, and then when you go from a yellow onion to a purple onion, the purple onion will have like the anthrocyanins, for example. So the quercetin that you see in the onions and the flavonoids will increase as the uh, onions have more color. So eating a variety of colored onions is really good for you. Now, very interesting in the benefits here. So this is, I would like to spend a little bit of time here because this is how important. So, you know, Chef, you're AJ, you're, you're, you love onions. I love onions. But this is one of the reasons why, because it does such drastic reduction on health conditions. Look at heart health. So one serving a day decreases the heart attack by 22%. I mean, if we had a drug that did that, you know, statins don't even do that, by the way. So, you know, reducing total cholesterol, bad cholesterol, helping blood pressure. So the number one cause of death in America is heart, heart attack. Uh, you know, just increasing the onions will decrease that rate of having a heart attack. Um, BPH and diabetes, again, those who eat onions actually lower the, the benign prostatic hyper, hypertrophy, large prostate in men, by 59%, right? So again, you know, most men, as we get older, the, as we get older, the prostate gets bigger, then we have more urinary symptoms, and then they got to do procedures or take drugs to help with the urinary flow. Just eating more onions in your diet is very, very important. Lowers blood sugar as well. There is a topical onion extract. You see it in the store. There's like one or two brands now that they've been patented, but they're for scars. And so there's actually studies where you, they put the onion extract gel on the scars and it makes them less red, smoother, improves the overall, overall appearance. And so that's something that's very safe. It's not a steroid, for example. It's not a bleaching agent. Uh, and you can just find those things over the counter in the uh, local pharmacy. It does have high quercetin in there. That quercetin is the flavonoid. It also has the allicin. Allicin is the part, part of the onions, just like allicin is also found in fresh garlic, which I mentioned before in the previous episodes, that has an antibacterial, antiviral effects. And then the anthrocyanins, which also comes in with the colored, like the purple um, onions. Now, interesting thing here, this is the lowering risk of just increasing onion in the diet, 25% lower breast cancer risk, 56% lower colon cancer risk, 60% lower uh, sorry, 56% colon cancer risk, 60% lower risk of endometrial cancer, 82% lower risk of esophageal cancer, 
73% lower risk of ovarian cancer, 54% lower risk of pancreatic cancer, and 71% lower risk of prostate cancer. Again, we don't have drugs that do anything like this. Okay. And so just having a little bit more onion in your diet. And when you look at all these spices, if you go back to the last, you know, eight series before this, you can see like how these are what they call stacking or compounding effects, right? There's a synergy. It's not just eating onions alone, but you're eating onions and you're having garlic and you're having turmeric and you're having ginger and you're having, you know, rosemary and you're having all these other spices uh, that are super important. And when you start adding that, that's really making the plant-based diet really food is medicine. So cancer reduction, you can't go better than this. Um, now, one thing that I did learn uh, now, outside of the allergies, because a lot of people understand quercetin, they take quercetin supplements. We actually have a, a wonderful, a high potency uh, a great quality uh, quercetin that people can use for allergies. It does block the release of histamines. Um, so when people you know, don't want to take a Zyrtec or a Claritin or Allegra, sometimes it dries their mouth or they, they still can get sometimes uh, a little bit of sleepiness or cognitive issues. Uh, quercetin is uh, a wonderful thing to have and we have a great source of Sanjevani quercetin available. Uh, but osteoporosis, this is something that's quite unique. I had no idea. So this is something that is like, wow, I, I like that uh, part of the onion. In perimenopausal and menopausal women who ate one or more onions a day, they had a bone density that was 5% higher than those who ate less than one onion per month. So that's pretty impressive because, you know, everybody's looking at bone density and medications to do that, which also have a lot of side effects. And there's a lot of natural products that we offer. We have a whole bone uh, protocol for support. If, if anybody goes, uh, wants to learn about our bone protocol, you can go to our sanjevany.net, look at the blog. It's called Maureen's blog, and you can listen to her. You can read her story of how she went from osteoporosis back to increasing her bone density. Every year she posts her bone density tests uh, and how we've been doing that naturally using evidence-based uh, products. So you can do that, but you can also now also increase that even more by adding more onions into the diet. Also decreasing the risk of hip fracture by 20%. So again, I, I can't express the importance of onions, not only for cancer, for heart disease, uh, but for overall antioxidant benefits, but also for osteoporosis, which is something that most of us um, really never thought about. Again, an example of onions. Now, I, we put onions on every type of food. I just took some simple things here, like French onions, pickled onions. You know, I love to caramelize onions. It's one of my favorite things. Putting caramelized onions, like on a on a plant based burger, is fantastic. Um, but uh, even glazing the, uh, the the balsamic onions, roasting them, uh, uh, are are very delicious, and making even dips. Uh, now, onions pair and complement with the following. You know, it pairs with uh, caraway, coconut cumin, garlic, ginger, kokum, marjoram, which remember marjoram, when you add to like uh, other uh, vegetables and other herbs, it actually potentiates and it enhances the antioxidant oxidant, uh, capacity and availability like multiple times. That was in my last episode. We'll talk about oregano next. Rosemary we'll also talk about next week. Uh, Sun-dried tomatoes, uh, thyme and turmeric, and it complements apples, curries, uh, grilled vegan meats, pizza. Most people think of you know pizza, relishes, sandwiches, and salads. Um, chef, if you're there, what is your favorite use of onions? Oh my God, I agree with you. And of course I'm there. I just turned my video off because it looks better while you're speaking. Sure. I agree with you. Caramelized onions, and you can easily do it without oil on sure. anything, but especially a plant burger. I mean, I wish you could just make like gallons and have them every day on everything. That probably is my favorite. But I also love raw onion on a salad. But you know what I really love is the green part of the green onion, the scallion. Like yeah. that makes everything delicious. Eat right. I I, I, I'm crazy about onions. I love onions. And one of the things, thank you for reminding about the scallions. So there was a study that was done, I believe, at one of the universities like Cornell or one of these, uh, you know, academic universities, they were looking at uh, the 13 different types of onions that we get here in the U.S. market, looking at the antioxidant capacities and the benefits. And what they found was that shallots actually have the highest. So those people who cook and, you know, want to get shallots. Uh, please get the shallots. The shallots are something that is, uh, now the shallots are a little bit more pungent. They have a little bit more of a garlicky kind of uh, taste and, 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 and a sense to that, but um, it is multiple fold. So it's more than a yellow onion and, and, and so many more times more fold than a Vidalia onion, for example, and all these things. So I like to use a variety of onions, you know, purple onions and 
and, and yellow yeah. onions, white and onions. I, you, you ever have the Maui, the sweet onions? Oh, I, I love, love I love those. Those yeah. might be my favorite. Be yeah. um, sometimes onions can be super pungent. Do you do you know why the religions that don't eat onion, what their reasoning is that they can't have onions? So some of that is due to the excitability of the onion. The onion and the garlic, what they believe or what they think in their culture is that it's an exciting aspect. So it's not a it's not a health reason why they don't want to take it. It's more of like it it, it may cause them to do other things. <laughs> so it's very interesting because they're trying to be very plain and non-stimulatory and onions and garlic have this little stimulatory, you know, because they're a little pungent, they're a little bit of this. But I always like to grill. I'm more of a grilling the onion person. So I, you know, I do eat them raw, but I like to always eat if I'm having a sandwich or, or, or a burger uh, or anything like that. I definitely like to grill it because that takes a little away with that little bit of that pungentness that most people feel like, oh, onions are too spicy. They make them cry or they just are a little bit off. But, and then it brings out that sweetness. It kind of starts to pull it out. You don't have to caramelize it all the time, but it's a nice thing just to, just to grill the onions. And here, like locally in the Southwest, we have a bunch of burger chains. They're not, they're not vegan, by the way, but what made them famous was they would grill their onions on their burgers. And that kind of made it different than any other chain uh, restaurants because people like that kind of sweetness and that it kind of brings out that nice taste of the onion. Yeah. What about people like on low FODMAP? I mean, that's got to be the hardest diet of all. No onions, no garlic. Yeah. So it's very interesting. I had this conversation this morning, actually. And what we're wondering is with people with FODMAPs, uh, with people with SIBO because of, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they find that the onion and the garlic kind of bothers them. And one of the reasons why it's not that it's bad for them. It's actually that the onions and garlic actually kill SIBO. And so, so we actually take products like we actually can have the patented form of the Allison. Uh, it's called Allison Max Pro. It's actually a patented form of the ingredient, the molecule that when you cut an onion or you cut garlic, and that becomes the antimicrobial uh, property. It's, it's not very stable, meaning like that's why when you cut, you know, if you're ever sick, just eating some fresh garlic and, and you know, chopping and eating some fresh, fresh, fresh onions make you cry, for example, but that actually will knock out a flu or a cold very quickly. Maybe people may not want to also hang around with you for a while, but uh, it is something that works really in like super effectively, super low cost. People are like, oh, I can't afford all these other things. Just just eat some onions and garlic uh, during your uh, 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 acute uh, flu or cold, and that kind of can knock it out. But you do have to eat it in the raw form. That's that pungentness that gives us the allicin. But now it's been stabilized, and we actually provide that in a pill form. So. Interesting thing is when people have like the SIBO and the FODMAPs because they're, they're, they're eating the FODMAPs because they have a bacterial overgrowth in the gut, right? So they're trying to eat things that don't have a lot of fiber that might cause bloating. The reason why the garlic and onions are on that, on the, on that list is because it has antimicrobial properties. And if they don't knock out that imbalance correctly, then it's kind of like giving them a little bit of an antibiotic naturally, but not consistently because most people are unlike you or me, chef, that we're always eating these things. But the interesting thing is that when you eat these items like onions and garlic, you actually treat the SIBO and you prevent it from coming back again. If you eat a plant-based diet and you're eating enough fiber, which is what most people aren't doing, that prevents the overgrowth from occurring again. So a lot of doctors, unfortunately, who are SIBO doctors or SIBO experts, and I see them at conferences, you know, when I attended their CME lectures, et cetera, it's like they have great protocols of here's how you treat it. And like, here's the Allison, which we carry in our office, or here's a natural antimicrobial for an overgrowth, for example. But, you know, or, you know, here's something from the garlic, which is the Allison or something from the onion which is Allison, but they don't tell people how to transition from the standard American diet or a paleo keto diet, which is low in fiber. And then that without that fiber, then this dysfunction of the gut continues because you have to feed your gut the short chain fatty acids. That is what your microbes eat. Uh, the prebiotics and probiotics, these are all plant-based. They don't come from any kind of, uh, uh, animal proteins. So this is important why uh, those people kind of feel like I can't eat that. But what happens is that just tells me that we got to fix their gut. And once we fix their gut, then they can eat this regularly. Then they have all the nutritional health benefits as you see here. All right. Number 35, oregano. Again, one of my favorites as well. Um, Infection protection. So oregano may help or treat and prevent the following age spots. They have some topical uh, data on studies on that. Alzheimer's disease, cancer. Uh, it's a really great uh, antimicrobial for candida, for bacteria, for viruses, 
for parasites. Oregano is one of the kind of the broad spectrum uh, in use. It does show it lowers cholesterol. It helps lower inflammation and colitis. It's been shown to be helpful for food poisoning and putting it into uh, food preparations uh, and products to help with preservation, to block things from spoiling as we've used historically uh, for centuries in canning and making foods and stuff like that. Um, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, blood sugar, liver support, and also can help with obesity. Now, again, heart health, again, since again, the number one cause of death, as I keep on hitting over and over again, like a broken record is heart disease. But if you see in almost all of these spices, as you can see on all these herbs is it helps lower your cholesterol. It actually stops the oxidation of the LDL. There is two components of this uh, oregano, uh, carva crawl and thymol. These are the really, really powerful, you know, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, antiparasitic, but these also have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and it lowers uh, inflammatory cytokines like TNF alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6. These are different interleukins in the body. Now, the interesting thing is what you have to be careful of when you take it from the diet, no problem. But there's a lot of use, like when we give oregano in our office, as you can see here, it says uh, antiviral, antifungal, antiparasitic, antibacterial, kills staph and strep, it kills candida, and it kills flu viruses. So these are all the things that have been shown in the clinical studies. Now, in our practice in 23 years in integrative medicine, we use a high potency, it's a physician's extra strength, uh, oregano P73 uh, soft gel, and it, it works great. People have an upper respiratory infection, bam, it knocks it out. We even have a nasal wash that is, is, is the same thing. They can use it for sinus infections. People even have H. pylori, that along with our berberine and along with some loracidin, and there's even a probiotic that we carry called Pyloguard that is used for um, maintenance of this H. pylori. So there's ways that we can knock out, uh, say, like something as stubborn and difficult as H. pylori, which out without using the triple antibiotic therapy that we usually have to give, which actually have a multitude of other side effects, right? Like dysfunctioning the microbiome even more. The problem with the use of oregano supplements, however, though, is that we always want to use it just as a targeted aspect. So, just, so when you eat it, you can eat it every day. You can use it for all the benefits that it is. But when we hyper-concentrate it into a capsule or a soft gel or a liquid or a tincture, and there's a variety of brands, but we like to use the one that has the clinical studies and the most potent 300% supercritical extract, that is. But when we use that, we only use it for a short, limited time, like we would an antibiotic. A lot of people see the anti-inflammatory benefits of oregano, and you'll see products out there for joint pain. And there's, there's one or two products out there that are really, really popular. I don't want to name them, but you can see them at the store. And one of the ingredients is oregano. And although it does help with lowering some of the inflammation, unlike bosmeric, which is the stronger anti-inflammatory, right? The product that we carry that has the curcumin C3 complex, the boswellia and the boswell PS and the ginger and the black pepper in a sustained release, you know, um, bilayered caplet. The problem with the oregano in joint products is that it also causes dysfunction to the microbiome because they're taking it every day for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. When we give the oregano as a medical treatment, for example, from an integrative or herbal medicine perspective, it's given and dosed similarly like an antibiotic, you know, three days, five days, seven days, 14 days, depending on the infection, but that's it. We're not continuously taking it. So some people who took supplements, which you'll see on the, in, in the market for joint pain that has oregano for the anti-inflammatory effect they actually have microbiome dysfunctions going long term. So I always remove people from those and say, hey, you need to take a natural anti-inflammatory that's not knocking out your microbiome. Doesn't mean we shouldn't use oregano, but we should use oregano mainly for when we're taking it as a supplement as a, um, as a treatment. And then you should be eating oregano as much as you can just to get all these wonderful benefits. It does have phenolic compounds that help with lowering blood sugar and also helps protection of liver enzymes, right? So remember when people have diabetes, people have fatty liver, people have liver elevation uh, due to other things in their diet uh, and environment, then we can help lowering some of those liver enzymes and protection of the liver with oregano. Again, as I mentioned with H. pylori, uh, you know, oregano is great. Again, we, we provide a whole protocol of how people can treat H. pylori uh, very successfully. And it does lower the risk of uh, cancers, particularly colon cancers. And in the cell cultures, it's been shown to kill lung cancer, blood cancer cells, and uterine cancer cells. Again, we wouldn't just use this as a sole therapy. Don't get me wrong. However, these are things that we, you know, as we look at people who live the 
longest and you look at people who you know are eating say mediterranean foods or kind of more plant-based or even look at all the people in the blue zones and you can look at their diets aside of being plant-based you will see that they eat lots of onions lots of other things that i've been talking about on the show oregano and turmeric and all these are things that are kind of in their diet as part of their daily medicine and there's some data that will show that the Oregano actually helps boost the brain chemical acetylchol uh, acetylcholine, and that's the same uh, mechanism of improving the neurotransmitter that Alzheimer's disease, you know, drugs work on as well. So this is something that um, you can see that those people who eat this may have improvement cognitive function as they get uh, older. So again, oregano, 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 as much as you can, uh, when you can, great. But if you use it as a supplement, you need to make sure you get in the right potency and then make sure that you're only taking it for a targeted amount of time. And we can help anybody, anybody that has H. poly right now, they can always contact our office and we can do a consultation and we can definitely help you get uh, better naturally. Examples of oregano. I love oregano. I, we use it a lot here in the Southwest. We use it a lot. You know, a lot of people think of pizza and Italian food, which I definitely love oregano in, but we also use it in a lot of Mexican food. We, you know, we also, we can make it like sauces with oregano, like chimichurri. We put it in like the black beans and the tacos and we make chili. We put a little bit of oregano in there as well. Um, so it's a great way to add uh, oregano to your daily food. Okay. Dr. Pai, what's the difference between Greek oregano and, and Mexican oregano? Because I've seen that actually on labels in stores for different Yeah, types. so actually, Mex great, great question, by the way. Yay. <laughs> Mexican oregano is actually, so it is actually stronger than regular oregano, but actually botanically, it's a different species. Now, interesting thing is it still has these two aspects. So it does have the carvacol and thymol. So chemically, you know, say like phytochemically, or, it does have all these same health benefits. It's just actually from a different plant species. But they call it Mexican oregano because it tastes like oregano. It looks like oregano, just a different plant species, and it's stronger. So there's a little bit more stronger taste to that. So we use a lot like when here in Albuquerque, you go to the store, you'll see I'll say Mexican oregano. We buy that for certain recipes just because we want that stronger kind of, of flavor of that, but um, it's a great question. I would use either both, like if you have it available, but you know, a lot of people here in the Southwest, we use a lot of Mexican oregano in certain uh, um, aspects, but then the uh, regular oregano that we think of, just say like Italian food and all, has a little bit um, uh, a lower pungency to that, or a little bit, less, you know, it's not as strong in terms of that, that strong oregano taste, but they both carry these two wonderful antioxidants and, uh, you know, antibacterial, antiviral uh, properties as well. Thank you. And you'll see like oregano, just like a lot of the spices that I mentioned before in previous episodes, a lot of times they also use it as preservatives. Remember, like you'll see in a lot of the past episodes, we said, oh, this is helpful for food poisoning. This is helpful for food poisoning. And that's why they use a lot of these things in the preservation when we make canned goods or we, you know, we store foods. There was always a little bit, not just for the taste for example, but also helps prevention of bacterial overgrowth and fungal overgrowth and all these things. So there's all these benefits of why, you know, we think of like refrigeration and, and, and processing foods today, and they put a lot of chemicals and preservatives. If you look at back in most of these traditional cultures that they still, they make things fresh and how they store it is, is the preparation of some of these spices that are not only healthy for us, but also helps preserve and maintain the uh, quality and freshness of the foods. Now, oregano pairs with ajuan, basil, bay, chili, cumin, garlic, marjoram, onion, pumpkin seeds, rosemary, sage, sun-dried tomatoes, and thyme. And it complements black beans. You know, I use you know, a lot of vegan cheeses, soups, eggplants. Uh, you know, we use like a green uh, vegan ground beef you can get out of any kind of uh, uh, source. Uh, it's a great kind of flavor to add into that. Uh, mushrooms, obviously, pastas and pizzas and sauces and, and uh, sauces and definitely uh, tomato sauces and dishes. Did you eat the, let me ask you, chef, the marjoram? You were going to do that over Thanksgiving. No, I I, you know, I, I, let me, you know what? I'm going to run and see if it's in my, I'm going to ask my husband to get me the poultry seasoning I use. I think it's in there and I'm going to tell you about it. And just okay. because that's, remember, we talked about that's going to help enhance all the antioxidants even more. So just sprinkling a little more, that was in the uh, episode eight. So if those people who are not understanding what we're talking about, go back uh, uh, to uh, part eight of the series, because that's something that's very fascinating on how you can actually boost a little bit more of all the rest in your salad. Marjoram is one of the things that bumps everything up multiple times in terms of health benefits. And lastly, we're going to talk about is parsley. 
Parsley is the antioxidant enhancer. Number 36 on our list out of 50. So, so far we've learned 36 different spices uh, and herbs to bring to the table. Now, parsley, uh, as you can see, there's two usually types of parsley. We see Italians more the flat kind. And then we also see curly, uh, American sometimes they call it. You know, curly is the one that you usually see in the restaurant. It's funny because it's, it's actually, you know, in, in the standard American restaurant, say if someone went to a, a breakfast place here or a sandwich place here, you know, they'd serve these platters, right? They used to have like eggs and bacon and hash browns, blah, blah, blah. And they used to always then put this little piece of, you know, parsley. People didn't understand that this, why this only thing that was green out of all this animal protein, what was that green for? Because at the very end of the meal, traditionally, you were supposed to take that parsley and chew on it because it helps with bad breath. Okay, it has not only the flavor and the smell, but it actually has the compounds that actually kill the bacteria that make bad breath. So that was the whole reason, uh, you know, in these restaurants. Now, of course, the, the, probably the, the quality of that parsley is the poorest, and it's not really a, a technical amount for any kind of really health benefit, but it was something at the end of the meal, instead of having a candy or a breath mint, was to give that parsley. So, you know, just to remind people, because a lot of people say, oh, I used to go to these places for breakfast on Sundays with my family, and they still always have this little piece of parsley in the middle of my meal on the plate. They didn't understand what that was for. They were thought that I was trying to make it a little bit healthier by putting that. But it also, parsley can help with, you know, cancer, constipation, again, heart disease, here we go, diabetes, ulcers, and help with kidney support. So when we look at the antioxidant support and the, and the cancer support of parsley, there's a, there's a component called apigenin. Now, you, people can see like there's supplements called apigenin, but really you can get it from food, by the way, you know, parsley and celery and, and, and all these compounds have apigenin, but it's really, really high in parsley. And um, it increases, it's a flavonoid as well. There's flavonoids in parsley as well, but it increases superoxide dismutase, SOD and glutathione. So although we give wonderful glutathione products in our office, we give liposomal forms of that and people take SOD kind of supporting supplements and things like that. Having the parsley actually will increase those Okay, and remember when you have glutathione in the body and you're eating a lot of vitamin C foods, right? And if you have also like alpha lipoic acid, which is in our in our liver formula, milk thistle, N acetylcysteine, selenium, and um, uh, alpha lipoic, alpha lipoic will then hang out and bring the glutathione and your vitamin C to hang out longer. But if you eat parsley along the way, that will help keep your glutathione going. So there's a, what we call a recycling and a synergy between nutrients of foods. And that's why we're trying to always eat a rainbow colored, uh, a variety of colors of phytonutrients in our diet, because that, that's not just one thing. It's a multitude that is helping kind of synergize your meals. Also, uh, parsley is high in vitamin A, vitamin C, and lutein. So remember, lutein is important for your eyes. Even though we have eye formulas that have lutein and all these other things, eating parsley, good. So anybody has you know, macular degeneration or, or vision issues or uh, otherwise, lutein uh, is important for parsley. So again, a lot of people think of parsley just like, oh, it's a little thing that's on my plate. Super, super important. And that's why other cultures eat a lot of parsley and they put a lot of parsley in their meals. It actually, the apigenin, that anti-cancer, that antioxidant kind of effect, it's actually like a chemo preventative effect. And it actually lowers ovarian cancer by 21%. So as I mentioned before, like, you know, how many things are lowering, right? The nutmeg, and then we looked at the, the uh, oregano, it's lowering. All these things are lowering. So if you eat a plant-based diet, your overall risk of cancer goes down significantly. It's not just heart disease, as we always talk about, but your cancer risk. And remember, cancer is kind of now prevalent, prevalent uh, in most of our culture and around the world. Uh, I had a patient the other day, and they actually were getting a chemotherapy and a natural uh, kind of immunotherapy is a natural jack inhibitor they call it, it's a pathway and um, it has a lot of toxicity and so she asked me like what else could i use that would kind of work on the similar pathway and i said well parsley is a it's been shown in cell culture to have the same you know, effect as a natural jack inhibitor. Uh, you know, when people have autoimmune diseases and their hair falls out and stuff like that, they give these jack inhibitors, but the problem is they have a lot, a lot of side effects. And so just having and eating a lot of parsley can help, you know, utilize those similar pathways without that side effects. Again, uh, kidney support. A lot of people think of parsley as a kidney tonic or a kidney flusher. It does help flush the kidneys and the urinary tract. So those people who eat more uh, parsley it actually helps prevent some of the kidney stones. Now, remember, 
oxalates are, are one of the foods that actually increase right uh with kidney stones oxalates are found heavily in animal protein but also in raw greens so we have to be careful when we do our nutrition testing with our our, our patients those people who come in who are super plant-based or more importantly when they come in and they're eating a raw diet like i only eat raw 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 they actually have super high oxalates and they actually have high risk of uh, getting kidney stones. So when we test their nutrition uh, tests and we actually look at the oxalic, oxalic markers, we can actually then tell them, hey, you know what you need to do? You need to start steaming and lightly blanching some of your greens. We did invent fire. I always remember uh, remind people that we did invent fire for a reason. And that actually helps you know break down some of these compounds. So eating completely raw can actually increase certain conditions. And people, you know, it's funny when we see and we hear now in the literature, uh, people who are vegan and they have uh, kidney stones, right? So it's like, what? They usually have the lowest than the, anybody on the population. But those, what the people who are vegan who have kidney stones are the raw vegan. So again, trying to make sure that you are, you know, steaming and cooking your greens often uh, is quite important. It does help lower blood pressure because parsley has a mild diuretic effect. So that's, and also has a mild laxative effect. So those people who have a little bit of constipation, again, having uh, a, a lot of parsley in your diet would be great. And as I mentioned before, uh, traditionally here in America, when we put the parsley at the end of the, uh, uh, the dish, it's for you know the bad breath. It does have chlorophyll. The chlorophyll in there it kills the oral bacteria that causes bad breath. And so it's something that you know usually uh, when you eat like a wonderful bowl of like tabbouleh, which is one of my favorites. You know tabbouleh uh, that has the the bulgur wheat in there and the tomatoes and, and a little bit of the lemon. Uh, again, you can do it oil free if you wanted to. Uh, and there's also gluten free you know uh, tabbouleh that people can have. But when people think of that kind of Middle Eastern and and Greek foods and stuff like that. It's great because they actually eat, you know, the, it's pre predominantly half of the bulgur wheat and half of the parsley. So it's that much they're consuming in the salad. Uh, chimichurri, again, sauces, again, you know, with the, with the parsley, you can use it with oregano. There's different type of, you know, sauces that we can make. And it's great to put as a marinade or, or, or to have as a dip. Uh, you can make uh, pestos with it as well. Uh, we, we do a lot of salads here in America. That's what I'm showing here. And I even saw this wonderful avocado ranch dressing with parsley uh, that had no oil. So there's ways that you can just kind of naturally use the parsley here. But I like, you know, eating it more like fresh, like in the salads and or making a sauce because that's something that's great. You can also get dried parsley fakes, by the way. And for those people who have kidney problems, you know, you can get the dried parsley flakes. The dried parsley flakes, although it doesn't taste as good as the fresh, obviously, it actually has hyper concentration of those compounds. And in the studies, it's been shown still to be helpful for kidney. So those people who can't get a lot of fresh or they have they live in a food desert, they don't have something, we'll just have some dried parsley flakes and try to add that. But you got to still add a significant amount, right? So add like a fourth of a teaspoon, a half a teaspoon or so into your food or, or more, but that still has health benefits. So don't discount parsley. Parsley then pairs with basil, bay leaf, uh, fennel seed, garlic, marjoram, mint, oregano, rosemary, sage, and thyme. And it complements beans, cheese, these are all vegan, by the way, uh, eggs, uh, legumes, lentils, and vegetables. So I like to use parsley because you can get it it's everywhere. You can grow parsley very easily. Uh, some things like parsley and mint can you know, hang out a long time. It's easy to grow. So try to bring more parsley into your diet as that would be very, very helpful. And again, I just want to remind everybody, we do have a Christmas and New Year sale at San Gemini. So December 22nd to January 1st, mark your calendar. It's 10% everything off in the store. You just check out and the discount will be provided. Uh, if you want to buy a book, Boss Merrick, uh, SR, we'll talk about it. An Inflammation Nation, you can read about my book. Or you can, if you're interested in learning more about our clinic you know, for the, for the new year, make yourself a gift of health of booking a consultation with myself. I'll be glad to help you transition to a plant-based diet, looking at food inflammatory triggers, looking at microbiome, looking at your nutrition, looking at stress reduction, all the epigenetic evidence-based therapies uh, that we can help you with. And I want to thank all of you again for part nine. Here we are talking about nutmeg, onion, oregano, and parsley. Again, sanjevany.net, sanjevany.store uh, for any further information. And I'll be glad to take any questions for the time remaining. Thanks. Well, one was sent in in advance, and I'll get to that on my phone in a minute. But I ran and got, you had asked me about marjoram. So I love, I don't think I ever had the spices at Local Spicery. I love them. They're small batch, non-irradiated. And so this is my favorite poultry seasoning and I use it in, you know, everything okay. holiday to taste delicious. And the ingredients are celery seed, sage, sweet chilies, onion, savory, rosemary, thyme, and margarine. And it See? is organic. 
Fantastic, it's right? So there's a reason why. So even though you didn't think like you used it, you do. And it's something that is actually enhancing. So all that rosemary, which I'll talk about next week um, and, and, and everything else like that, um, we're going to bring uh, more. Next week, I'm going to be talking about, just by the way, uh, pomegranate, pumpkin seed, rosemary, and saffron. Some of my favorites, actually, pumpkin seed, rosemary, and saffron. I love those. And so we'll get into some of that seed. next year. I'm, I never think of pumpkin seed as a spice. Yep. We'll cover that. <laughs> Interesting. Well, saffron is very, very expensive. I believe it's the number one most expensive spice in the world. It is. And we'll talk about uh, 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 saffron and where to get it or how to get it. One thing for those people who are interested in nutmeg, there's a great video. I just, it's funny when I was doing some research the other day, it's things always just come up, you know, it's like it always comes up when I'm looking at stuff. But if you go, if there's someone types in a business insider, which is like a news like you know on business and you type in nutmeg you'll see that there's an area in india called palachi and they actually it's a village and they those farmers were traditionally the farmers used to grow the most um highest quality grade of nutmeg in the world now it's about 50 dollars per pound now if you go to grenada or any other place like that where also they grow a lot of um, nutmeg is about $13 a pound. And if you go to here in the United States, it's about anywhere from $3 to $8 per pound. The quality of nutmeg is so different. And so it's nice if you can go look at And if you ever find it, nutmeg and it says Palachi or the source where that's coming from, you'll actually have the highest quality. And also there's something called mace that most people know about. That's like the other part of the nutmeg. And there's a little, if you go to Business Insider, type in nutmeg, they have a nice little video. It's like a 10 minute video. Like they did the, they did the research showing how the farmers now are doing a collective. And it's like you're buying it and purchasing directly from the farmer rather than all these independent uh, middle people. And it's a great way to help support uh, local farmers, but also get the best quality. So if those people who are interested in nutmeg, definitely take a look at that and don't mind spending. The nice thing about nutmeg also, just letting you know, is that it stays pretty well, like it's as a whole. So you want to buy as much whole nutmeg and then grind it when you can. But even if you do that and you seal it, it can be up to a year that it maintains its, its, its potency. So unlike other herbs that sometimes like after several months it's gone, uh, you can buy just a couple of you know whole nutmegs, the right, the right quality, and that will go a long way. Great. You know, I guess I have had marjoram. I just haven't had it by itself is what right. I meant as a standalone spice. Okay. So this question is for Gunther. And he said, a person in November, which means he's watching the show. Thank you. Last month. Asked Dr. Pai if there were any spices good for improving eye vision. I don't think he answered that. So I guess I'm going to say uh, parsley now because of the lutein. <laughs> I'll have to look at that. Right? You have to send me an email that remind me again. But uh, that's something that, again, looking at all the antioxidants, but since it does have lutein in there, then that's something that, you know, in the research was talking about helping with uh, um vision issues. Again, it won't be as strong as just getting a lutein type of supplement. Like we have an eye formula. We even have peptides that I call revision. That is actually the specific peptides that actually go back into the retinal part of the eye. Uh, but from a food source, food source, then the lutein itself would be great from parsley. Nice. I can't wait till you get to the end of the alphabet. Cause then I think, and I hope you're going to cover V for vanilla. I'm sure they'll be there. If not, I, we will put it in for you. <laughs> I love that. Oh, let me go. I mean, I've been looking, um, let me go look in the chat to see if there's any questions. If there are, please preface them with four question marks. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, I'm curious. Uh, you know, I had a chef on the show the other day using nutmeg and she, I, cause you know, a lot of people use a microplane, you know, right. yeah. it was the coolest tool where it was this little, little plastic thing. I think it was plastic. It might've been yeah. glass and it was almost like a little vice and it was just the coolest tool I've ever seen. Yeah. A lot of people, I mean, that's what I was saying, like in the 18th century here in Connecticut, it was, it was something that, you know, again, the upper society, they would actually, the men would carry, you know, you think of like all these gilded ages kind of shows, but they would actually take the nutmeg and then the kind of grind it to show that I have the spice to grind it on my meal. It was very, it was, very, it was a very showing thing, but uh, yeah, it's great to have that fresh, you know, if anybody gets a whole nutmeg and they actually grind it and then they make like a, an apple cider eggnog or any kind of, you know, you start baking it or putting it in pie or cookies or something like that, the taste is so deep and rich. It's just different than when you just get something at the store that says, here's nutmeg. Remember, the potency will be lost over time. And remember, by the, if you buy a big, you know, uh, package of it, usually by the time you get it, it's losing a lot of the volatile oils. So try to get things a little bit smaller, a little bit more fresh. 
in the next year, in, the, in January or so, we're going to start carrying in our office some of the spices, the, our favorites, not a big line, but we, we found a supplier that we like to use that are small local farms in India that is a, like a, a, a co-op. And um, we'll be able to have like small little packages and little tins, which are really nice uh, to support local uh, cooperative farms. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And you bring up a good point that, you know, even though they may save money in bulk stores buying huge, you know, yeah. bottles of spices, I agree with you. That's what I love about local spiceries that, you know, they're smaller. So they're going to, it's not that they'll be bad for you if they are old, but they, they're more potent and they are more flavorful. I remember when my mother passed away, I swear she had this metal tim of, you know, that mustard, that Goulden's it's, it's like dried mustard. I right. mean, it was like from when I was one year old, it's like, you know, <laughs> I mean, I kept it just for posterity, but I, yeah, a lot of people, unfortunately, like say they get married or they move into a new house and they go to the store and they buy like some kind of, someone will buy them a gift set of like, here's spices. And it'll literally stay like when we go cooking uh, uh, with our, to our clients' houses and, you know, we show them cooking and then we open up their cupboards, you know, cause we help them with shopping and filling up how they fill their pantry. Uh, a lot of times we will find things that are just full, you know, and, um, uh, it's something that uh, they haven't changed in you know years or decades. Right. Um, so you're asking the name of the nutmeg grinder, grinder, Linda. I don't know. I'm going to see if I can find it and put it in the chat. You know, who, who was the first person to discover that spices were medicinal? Was it the traditional Indian medicine man that we hear about? I think traditionally in India, you know, we've been using the Ayurvedic uh, medicine. We've been using spices all along. Um, because there's qualities of that. So they have um, in Sanskrit, it's, you know, it's, it's just like I mentioned before with the, the nutmeg used in formulas for diarrhea. So this goes back, you know, they may not have known what rotavirus is, but they knew that there's a viral diarrhea and that they knew that they can use this to treat it. So now what, what happens is that we're just exploring from a scientific perspective uh, the benefits of these foods. But as I mentioned before, you know, and, and I mentioned in every episode, it's important to bring the spices back into the plant-based diet because a lot of things right now, which I consider uh, plant-based to me as quite bland and not very flavorful. And that's why people get turned off. And when we look at even using substitutes or mock foods, how we make them taste better or taste something similar to what they're used to, the standard American diet palate is by using these flavors. Because actually people are more attracted actually to the flavors of the spices than actually the, and the texture second. So if we can mimic that, like you're having a poultry spice, for example, right, that people are going to have this memory of using it on, you know, chicken or something like that, then if you're putting that on a tempeh or a tofu or any kind of seitan or, or you know, any, any other kind of uh, dish, it's going to still bring back that flavor that they're used to. So they're not going to really miss that it's not necessarily, say, poultry itself. Nice. Thank you. And Linda, I did Google it and it's called a nutmeg mill. They're very affordable, less than $20 on Amazon. And Linda said, can people on the keto diet have onions? I don't know what that diet is really exactly. So, so I don't see why it's not a really high glycemic food. It does lower blood sugar. So it's, it's not a, no, I mean, they should, they shouldn't be eating a keto diet, but it's not contradictory. It, so anybody that's eating a, a really low glycemic, uh, low carb diet, you know, again, all the data will show that that's not really helpful for any means. In fact, there's been a couple of more recent videos talking about how that actually starts to worsen, which we've known and we've seen in the, in the literature and with our patients, because a lot of people come in with keto diets because they're trying to either lose weight or they have cancer and they're thinking like, oh, this is going to stimulate it. Uh, but you know, what they're also not doing is they're not eating all the spices. So they can, they need to start increasing the spices and increasing the, uh, antioxidants, phytonutrients, the, uh, anti-inflammatory foods, the fiber rich foods, and the no cholesterol and low saturated fat foods as well. Yep. Somebody asked if you covered cardamom. You did indeed. It was, I did. it was episode three. Thank and you. Yeah. So they can find that on the YouTube channel. And Patty says, I was taught by a doctor lad that onions can cause irritability and irritability and garlic can drain your energy and disturb sleep. Well, I know that lack of onions would cause me to be irritable. Right. And so that's where like we're talking about your question before with certain religions and certain, you know, groups of people who there's an effect that onions and garlic can be stimulatory in that sense, right. To certain body types or certain, you know, people. And so, uh, but what I look at as, as the flip is like, we always looking at having everything that's a mixture. So yeah, if someone was overdoing something, then definitely could be a problem. But then if one food throws them out of so much balance and there's actually more imbalance going on. So I'm not uh, too worried about that. And, uh, just from that, that perspective of, uh, 
of uh, Dr. Lad, he was looking at a lot of things from an Ayurvedic perspective, from a from an a, a, um, internal medicine perspective, but his specialty was not looking at you know all the other different type of conditions outside of internal medicine, which he was kind of known to be treating. Uh, so again, a lot of things were put on him since he was an early Ayurvedic physician in the United States who brought Ayurveda kind of to the forefront, you know, in a Western uh, recognition. But there's a lot of pressure on one person to say you re represent the whole science, uh, because in India, we would, you know, if you saw 10 other Ayurvedic doctors or a thousand other Ayurvedic doctors, they might take a, a different uh, angle to that. Nice. Well, this has just been such an interesting series. I mean, when it's over, will you have another type of series? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're, gonna, we're trying to work on as the cameras, as I mentioned before. So we would like to do a little bit more cooking demonstrations or something like maybe take a, a lot of these spices and put it together as a dish or as a prep. I'm trying to figure out how to do the camera stuff. Uh, that would be kind of fun and interesting. And then also just have open discussion on other aspects of food as medicine and uh, supplements and the differences when you should use a supplement and when you shouldn't. Uh, that's also important as well. I mean, we're always looking at, you know, potency, purity, safety, efficacy. I just had, you know, I don't know if you saw last week, but there was a big push on uh, LinkedIn and a lot of the uh, data was like, oh, turmeric was causing a problem. There was a lady who had liver problems and all this stuff like that. And when they traced it down and she took a, a Costco turmeric and I actually had a patient just two weeks ago and a patient last week as well, having an issue with a Costco turmeric. And it's like, yeah, because 43% of all turmeric on the market has lead contamination and, and it's synthetic synthetically made and stuff like that. So that it makes a big difference of where you get your source. And that's why when what we're famous for, what I'm famous for in our flagship, when we use Boz American, I was like, we're using gold standards. We're looking at non-irradiated. We're looking at non-synthetic. We're looking at, you know, a potency purity. We're looking at heavy metals and pesticides and molds and all those contaminants. We're looking at what's used in the clinical study and also giving the clinical dose so that you can get a benefit of it. So this is a challenge that a lot of people just walk to the store and they go, well, I can get, get this like super cheap, just like they can get cinnamon in a big old, you know, one pound, you know, container versus like a small little cinnamon. And it's like, yeah, but that's not going to have the blood sugar reducing or cholesterol reducing effects. It might make your cookies and your coffee taste well, but it doesn't have the medicinal aspect. So that's why, you know, people come to our, our shop and they come to us as patients. Now, people can, who don't have to be our, a client of ours to come shop at our store or to look at any of our products. Our goal is to actually elevate and, and improve the aspect of the industry Every day, there's people who are cheating from Amazon and on onwards that, you know, all these things are having problems. And we're trying to raise the level of evidence-based uh, therapy so that people can still have choice uh, in using an integrative approach to their health. Great. Thank you. I was going to let you go, but you're such a great guest. You have so many fans, but I just saw two more questions in the chat. What is the best source of turmeric and what spices lower blood sugar? Well, I had a lot of blood sugar ones in the past eight. So you can go back and listen yes. to those. That's what, a lot. Wasn't cinnamon, I believe cinnamon, cinnamon is one. one. Cinnamon is one. Almost yeah. all of them, like I mentioned, even today, you know, a few that actually will do that. So that's why eating again, those will help reduce that. The best so source of the, of the turmeric by itself, if you're getting it as a spice, you want to get organic always. If you're using it as a uh, as a supplement, then the bosomeric is the form that we carry. It has the best form as a supplement. If you're not getting it in that form, and you can just look at bosomeric.com, if you're not getting that, if it doesn't say that exact name on the label of that ingredient, getting it from the manufacturer, not a third party that puts it in because there's been adulteration every time someone else touches that. So that's one thing that, you know, the, we're the expert. If someone wants to have a deeper dive into that discussion, definitely get a copy of my book, An Inflammation Nation, uh, because there's a whole chapter on how to, how to distinguish that. And also comparing it to all the other patented forms or other types that you might see marketed in the store that say it's better, it's stronger, it's faster, and we debunk all that marketing myth. Great. Well, thank you so much. And what spices are next? So next, again, we are going to have, I believe it was pomegranate, pumpkin seed, rosemary, and saffron. And I'm wishing all the listeners, thank you very much for this wonderful year of listening to Healing Spices. Yeah. That's and right. we will, what are you do, what are you doing for the holidays? Just what's spending spice, it with family, just low key. What spices are going to be in your holiday meal? <laughs> actually, it's funny because we don't actually do a standard. We usually do like a southwestern dip, like southwestern uh, meal. So we usually make Christmas tamales, uh, and so we kind of do it like a southwestern flair uh, change to that. So it's kind of like if you went to a. Uh, you know, a, a nouvelle restaurant. We kind of we don't do the you know because we're we're plant based, so we're not going to have the turkey and the and the the Christmas hams and stuff like that. But we actually do a southwestern uh, holiday meal. 
Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pai. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to see you next year. And stay tuned. And I hope to see everyone tomorrow. And I'll tell you who the guest is, but I keep forgetting to tell you my publisher is running a special two of my books, Lower Than You Can Get Them Separately. Well, not separately, but you know what I mean. And free shipping in the US, lots and lots of bonuses. The link is in the show notes. And tomorrow at 11, we have Dr. Nicole Avina. She has a TED Talk with like millions of views about sugar. She has a new book called Sugar Less, and we'll be discussing it tomorrow. You're not a fan of real sugar, right, Dr. Pai? I'm, I'm no, we actually try to reduce as much uh, refined processed sugars in the diet. Absolutely. Uh, we're not worried about any natural sugars that actually come in foods like fruits and stuff like that. And I don't mind people using if, you know, some vegans don't want honey, uh, but we don't mind a little bit of honey in my practice uh, for other health reasons. Uh, we also use like maple syrup and some of these other things like that. So yeah, but cutting down on the overall total, total added sugar to the diet, definitely people need to do for sure. Yeah. You ever, you ever use dates? I love dates. I love, in fact, I get dates from the farm actually it comes from a, in a big, like I usually like two or three dates a day as a dessert in the evening. It's great. So great. What's your favorite? Mine's the B-A-H-R-I, the Bari. I like the, just the big old Medjool dates. You like the big ones. Okay. The big yeah. ones that come, they're super soft. They come from the farm. Yeah. They're great. Okay. They're so good. Thanks so much. I hate to thank you. you. Have sister. a happy holiday and happy new year's and see you soon. Thank you so much. Hope to see everyone tomorrow at 11 for Dr.